Hi, just a quick reminder that this podcast has merch, a Patreon, a Fiverr gig, and some affiliated links. The links to everything that I just mentioned will be in the show notes. Alright, now enjoy the show. I have to give a quick content warning here, because in this episode, there is some physical violence. So, listener discretion is advised. This is Salvador Dali Part 2. So there was a Salvador Dali Part 1, and I recommend that you listen to that episode before you listen to this episode. But if you don't want to do that, that's okay. You do you. If you need a little bit of a refresher, I have a recap for you. Here's the recap. Salvador Dali was born to a strict father and a caring mother. From a young age, Salvador loved antics and he was known to sometimes be violent. He also had a love for art. Salvador went to school, but he was kicked out because he said that he was better than the professors there. But at that art school, he made some lifelong friends, including Frederico Garcia Lorca. Salvador became an artist of the Surrealist movement. He fell in love with one of his friend's wife, a woman that went by the name Gala. Gala was known to be cruel and hateful and pretty much no one liked her. Salvador and Gala didn't have a sex life because despite Salvador's art having a lot of sexual themes, Salvador actually didn't like sex. So they had an open marriage. And that is all that you need to remember to follow along with this week's episode. So, let's get started. The 1930s brought a change in Salvador Dali's life. The heroes that he looked up to had turned their back on him and booted him out of the Surrealist movement for his support of fascism. The 1940s would bring about another change, a change of scenery. Salvador was a person that always wanted more, but often the problem with wanting more is, more is never enough. Hi, my name is Courtney Jewell, and you are listening to the sixth episode of the fifth season of History Shelf, a podcast about history that proves that sometimes fact is even more interesting than fiction. Welcome to Season 5 of History Shelf. This season is titled History, Taylor's Version. That is because these 14 people that I will be covering this season all have one thing in common. The one thing they have in common is they all have been name dropped in a Taylor Swift song. Now, don't stop listening if you are not a fellow Swifty like me. This season is not going to be about Taylor Swift. You don't have to be a Swifty to enjoy this season. You just have to be a history lover. So please, stay, stay, stay. What we are going to do is you and I are going to go on a little adventure that spans 2,404 years. Who I am going to cover this season are fearless leaders, people from the screen, poets straight from the torture poets department, and people who were just trying to find a place in this world. Some of these stories may be stories of happiness. They may be sad, beautiful, tragic, but long story short, I hope that you will be enchanted to get to know the stories of these historical figures all too well. So, are you ready for it? For this week, I am talking about Salvador Dali once again. Getting kicked out of the Surrealist movement did not make Salvador quit his antics. In 1936, Salvador went to the premiere screening of Joseph Cornell's film, Rose Hobart, at Julian Levy's gallery in New York City. Salvador got angry, and in a rage, he knocked over the projector. He said, quote, My idea for a film is exactly that. I never wrote it down or told anyone, but it is as if he had stolen it. End quote. He worked on a window display for Bonwit Teller in 1939, and some unauthorized changes were made to his display. Again, anger took over him, and he pushed a display bathtub through a plate glass window. He would later, in 1955, deliver a lecture at 
Sorbonne, and he arrived in a Rolls Royce covered in cauliflowers. And in 1962, he promoted Robert Discharn's book, The Worlds of Salvador Dali, by appearing in a Manhattan bookstore on a bed while wired up to a machine that traced his brain waves and blood pressure. He would autograph books while being monitored, and the person who bought the book would also receive the paper chart recording. Salvador didn't believe that he had to change. He saw nothing wrong with his behavior. He was a man that truly loved himself. He once said, quote, Every morning upon wakening, I experience a supreme pleasure, that of being Salvador Dali, end quote. In 1939, Salvador left the Surrealist movement behind. He moved into his classical period. On June 22, 1940, France fell to Nazis. Salvador and Gala thought that it would be best to get out of Europe. So they left via Spain for the United States. Before they left, Salvador met with his father. It was the first time that they had met in 10 years. Salvador and Gala would remain in the United States until 1948. By the time that Salvador arrived in America, art critics were done with him. They did not take him seriously anymore. Some big things happened to Salvador when he was in America. In 1941, the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in New York gave him his own retrospective exhibit. He also finished writing his own autobiography, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, and it was published in 1942. I talked a little bit about his autobiography in last week's episode. Now, I think that it is a good idea to approach any autobiography with caution because no one can be biased when telling their own life story. But Salvador's autobiography should be read with extra caution because he purposely mixed fact with fiction. I guess no one told him that sometimes fact is even more interesting than fiction. A muse of Salvador's was French model and singer Amanda Lear. He was fascinated with her. She had started a rumor that she was a transgender woman, and he loved that. He was fascinated by it, in fact. He told her, quote, It's always been the Grecian ideal, the hermaphrodite, the divine being, end quote. When the rumor was picked up by the tabloids, he said, quote, Everyone will be intrigued by you. You're neither a girl nor a boy. You're angelic, an archetype, end quote. She posed for several of Salvador's paintings. She was with Salvador in Gala for 15 years. She said that her and Salvador were united in a spiritual marriage on a deserted mountaintop. She later became a successful recording artist without any encouragement from Salvador. He told her, quote, Talent and creative power are located in the testicles. End quote. Starting in 1945, for the next 15 years, Salvador would paint 19 large canvases that included scientific, historical, or religious themes. The first of these paintings was painted after the dropping of the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. This period was called nuclear mysticism. His work combined meticulous detail with fantastic and limitless imagination. He would incorporate optical illusions, holography, and geometry within his paintings. In 1945, Salvador painted My Wife Naked looking at her own body, which is transformed into steps, three vertebrae of a column, sky, and architecture. I also saw that the painting's title is listed as My Wife Nude, contemplating her own flesh becoming stairs, three vertebrae of column, sky, and architecture. Salvador stepped back into the world of film again in 1945 when he assisted Alfred Hitchcock on the set of his film Spellbound. In 
in Spellbound, Salvador's paintings were used in a dream sequence, and they gave clues to solving the secret to the character John Ballantyne's psychological problems. Salvador also worked with Walt Disney on a short animated film titled Destino that wasn't released by Walt Disney Studios until 2003. This short film is 6 minutes and 40 seconds long, and it follows the story of Kronos and his ill-fated love for a mortal woman named Dahlia. There is no dialogue in this film. Dahlia dances through surreal scenery inspired by Salvador's paintings. How Salvador Dali and Walt Disney's worlds collided has been a story that has been passed down. This is a word of mouth story that I am about to tell you and I think it's always best to take these types of stories with some salt. The story goes that Salvador and Walt met at a dinner party at the home of Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. In August of 1944, Salvador was staying with Jack Warner while he worked on Spellbound. The two headed off well and found out that they had a lot in common. Salvador was a fan of Walt's. He thought that he was a great American surrealist. Somehow, Salvador also crossed paths with another American, a socialite named Rebecca Harkness. He made her a starfish brooch that has two butterflies that can be attached to the arms. The brooch is platinum and yellow gold and made with a pearl, diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. And that wasn't the only piece of jewelry that he designed in his lifetime. He collaborated on a line of jewels called Dali Joys with Cummins Catherwood. One of the pieces is the Royal Heart. It is a ruby, diamond, and emerald encrusted heart that actually beats. In 2023, Rebecca Harkness's brooch sold at Christie's New York for $982,800. But to my fellow Swifties, I did not find any evidence that Salvador and Rebecca were friends. I found no evidence that they ever played cards together like what is mentioned in The Last Great American Dynasty. So perhaps that is just folklore. Salvador had a complicated relationship with religion. I told you last week that his mother was Catholic and his father was an atheist. When Salvador was younger, he leaned more towards his father's beliefs in the films that he made with Louis Boudel, priests are portrayed as corrupt, ignorant, and hypocritical. He also drew a blasphemous image of Christ and the Sacred Heart in 1929 entitled Sometimes I Spit with Pleasure on the Portrait of My Mother. His family was not too pleased with that. He also blamed Catholicism for his profound sense of guilt about sex. But in the 1940s, his views started to lean more towards his mother's beliefs. He believed that science and religion could be fused together. He began painting Gala as a Renaissance Madonna. He met with Pope Pius XII in a private meeting in 1949. He showed the Pope his painting, Madonna of Port Ligat. The next year, he announced that he was a Catholic without faith. Salvador continued to reconcile Catholic dogma with science in his paintings. Salvador's sister, Ana Maria, published a book in December of 1949. It was titled Salvador Dali, Seen by His Sister. This book was not kind to Gala, and it pissed Salvador off. Because of this book, Salvador broke off all ties with his family. In September of 1950, Salvador's father died. Salvador didn't know until his father died that his father had basically disinherited him from his will. Salvador had left some paintings and drawings at his father's home, and Salvador entered into a two-year legal dispute over them. During this legal battle, Salvador was accused of assaulting, 
a public notary. In 1952, Salvador began painting the disintegration of the persistence of memory. Salvador made several appearances on television shows in Spain, France, and the United States. Television shows like The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson, and The Mike Wallace Interview. On January 27th, 1957, he was on the television show What's My Line? If you don't know what What's My Line was, it was an American game show where a celebrity panel questioned either members of the public or a famous guest to try and guess their job. He answered yes to almost every question that he was asked, like saying yes, his job had something to do with sports. Look, he was an asshole, but the clip of him on What's My Line is actually quite funny and I recommend you looking it up. Since Salvador's Catholic faith was growing stronger, in 1958, Salvador and Gala married in a religious ceremony in Spain. Andre Breton, if you remember back to last week's episode, he was one that was really trying to push Salvador out of the Surrealist movement, and if you remember, he succeeded. But he tried and failed against the inclusion of Salvador's Sistine Madonna in the Surrealist intrusion in the Enchanter's Domain expedition organized by Marcel Duchamp in New York in 1960. In 1963, Salvador painted Portrait of My Dead Brother. He had his first major solo retrospective show in the Saibu Museum in Tokyo. He was knighted Grand Cross of the Order of Isabella the Catholic in 1964. He was pictured taking an anteater for a walk in Paris in 1969. And then he appeared on an American talk show, The Dick Cavett Show, walking another anteater. But his great love was his pet ocelot named Babu. It was supposedly gifted to him by the Colombian head of state in the 1960s. He kept Babu on a stone-studded collar and took Babu everywhere, including a luxury ocean liner, the SS France. One time, he took Babu into a Manhattan restaurant, causing one diner to freak out. Salvador wanted to calm the woman down, so he told her that Babu was just a house cat that he had painted himself. But I wouldn't consider Salvador an animal lover. And I'm not just talking about whether or not owning an ocelot is ethical. I'm also referring to the collaboration that Salvador did with Philippe Holzman. He collaborated with Philippe to make the iconic Dali Atomicus photo. The process took 28 attempts. Each of those attempts involved throwing three cats in the air and flinging buckets of water on them. 1971 brought the inauguration of the Dali Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. It was moved to St. Petersburg, Florida in 1982. Salvador became an associate member of the Royal Academy of Science, Letters, and Fine Arts of Belgium in 1972. From the years 1960 to 1974, Salvador spent a lot of his time creating the Dali Theater Museum in Figueres, Spain. The building had formerly housed the Municipal Theater of Figueres. That was where Salvador had his first public expedition when he was just 14 years old. The museum opened in 1974. I already told you last week that Salvador was terrible with money. He would go into restaurants and buy the most expensive items on the menu. When he was done, he would ask for his bill. He would write out a check for the amount of the bill and sign it but then he would draw on the back of the check. 
He knew that the owner would not cash the check. Instead, the owner would keep the check because they now had an original dolly. So instead of cashing it, they would frame it and put it up in their restaurant. Salvador's money troubles wasn't helped by the fact that Gala had an affinity for Salvador's money. She liked to gamble it away in large sums in underground casinos in New York. Gala liked to keep many lovers in her bed well into her 80s. When she was in her late 70s, she became love-struck with the Broadway actor Jeff Finholt. She had gifted several of Salvador's canvases without Salvador knowing. He only found out when he saw that Jeff had put his artworks up for auction at Christie's. Gala even bought Jeff a house on Long Island valued at $1.25 million. Gala was almost certainly senile in her later years and she started medicating Salvador with concoctions of unidentified drugs. And the drugs may have led to a nervous disorder that brought on Parkinson's disease and ended Salvador's career. But Gala was still desperate for money, so she would force Salvador to sign blank canvases, and then she would commission forgerers to complete the paintings and then sell them at sky-high original dolly prices. So, dealers are often suspicious of any dolly pieces created from the mid-1960s and onward. Salvador broke up with his business manager, Peter Moore, in 1974, which led to Salvador Dolly and Taylor Swift having a similar experience. All of Salvador's rights to his collection were sold without his permission by other business managers, just like Taylor Swift's masters were sold without her permission. Salvador's rights to his collection being sold made Salvador lose most of his wealth. Two wealthy American art collectors named A. Reynolds Morse and his wife Eleanor that knew Salvador since 1942, set up an organization called Friends of Dolly. This foundation boosted his finances and kept him from having to file for bankruptcy. This is also the organization that established the Salvador Dolly Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. In 1978, Salvador was elected to Academic de Vue Arts in Paris. In 1980, Salvador was treated for depression, drug addiction, and Parkinson's disease. In 1980, he went to Port Illigat to recover from an illness. In 1981, he was knighted Grand Cross of the Order of Charles III. And in 1982, he was created First Marquess of Dali of Pouval by King Juan Carlos. In Salvador and Gala's later years, they grew estranged. Gala would go off to her castle, and sometimes they would spend weeks apart, and Salvador would need a written invitation from Gala to go see her. Salvador grew paranoid that Gala was going to leave him. He was angry at her for giving her lovers lavish gifts, and I'm going to warn you, I am about to talk about domestic violence, so if that's a trigger, then you might want to skip over this part. Salvador became violent with Gala. He broke two of her ribs one time. Gala gave him some Valium and other drugs to calm him down, and it almost killed him. But even though Salvador and Gala had grew estranged in their later years. On June 10th, 1982, Salvador suffered his biggest heartbreak, one even bigger than when his mother died. That was the day that Gala died. She was 87 years old. She died of influenza. 
After Gala's funeral, Salvador spent his time at their home, the castle of Pupal, locked away in his surrealist tower. He drew the curtains and he would not eat or drink. He would allow no one in and no one was allowed to say Gala's name. He wrote in the Unspeakable Confessions in 1973 that the castle was a testament to his love. Quote, Everything celebrates the cult of Gallia, even the round room with its perfect echo that crowns the building as a whole, and which is like a dome of this galactic cathedral. When I walk around this home, I look at myself and I see my concentricity. I like its Moorish rigor. I needed to offer Gala a case more solemnly worthy of our love. That is why I gave her a mansion built on the remains of a 12th century castle. The old castle of Bubal in the Besbal, where she would reign like an absolute sovereign, right up to the point that I could visit her only by handwritten invitation from her. I limited myself to the pleasure of decorating her ceilings so that when she raised her eyes, she would always find me in her sky." End quote. Gala was interred at that castle, but she almost wasn't. Gala died at their home in Port Bigot. There was a law passed in the 1940s that prohibited moving a dead body without official permission, but Salvador wrapped her body up in a blanket and, aided by his nurse, placed her corpse in the back seat of their Cadillac DeVille, so they gave her the weekend at Bernie's treatment. Gala's chauffeur was worried that her ghost would be mad at him because she always liked to ride in the front seat. Salvador painted his last painting, The Shallows Tale, from the series on Catastrophe, in 1983. There was a fire that broke out in his bedroom in Pupal Castle on August 30th, 1984. He was severely burned in the fire. The fire was caused by a short circuit in the electrical system of the bell that he used to call his nurse. But some have questioned the fire and they think that it's a possibility that he may have had something to do with the fire. They think that he was trying to kill himself. He sustained first and second degree burns on his right leg because of the fire. And he was confined to a wheelchair due to his injuries. He did not go to the hospital to treat his burns because he did not want to leave the castle because that was where Gala was buried. And his aides and nurses almost got in trouble because he was so malnourished. And people thought that neglect was going on, but the truth is he was doing it to himself. He wasn't eating and taking proper care of himself. It was like when Gala died, he just lost all of his will to live. He moved to Torre Galatea after the fire. In November of 1988, Salvador was entered into a hospital in Figueres, Spain with a failing heart. After a brief convalesce, he returned to the Dale Theater Museum. That is... Tori Galatea. Salvador always was afraid of death. He was so afraid of death that he was hoping to avoid it. But death comes for us all eventually. And death came for Salvador Dali on January 23rd, 1989 in Figueres, Spain. He died of heart failure. He was 83 years old. His funeral was held at the Dali Theater Museum and that is where he is buried. And you know what? Despite the fact that he was devastated by both of their deaths, Gala's, or even his mother's name, wasn't the name that was on his lips when he died. 
According to a nurse, she heard him say, my friend Lorca. Usually a person's story ends with their death because, well, what else is there to tell after a person has died? But usually doesn't mean always. And it's only fitting that a person that was so unusual like Salvador Dali was, that they wouldn't have the usual ending. Many years after Salvador Dali's death, there was a fortune teller named Maria Pilar Abel Martinez that claimed that her mother had an affair with Salvador while her mother was working as a maid for his neighbors in Port Ligat. Maria claimed that she was the product of that love affair. DNA was taken from Salvador's death mask, but the results were inconclusive. So, on June 26, 2027, a judge ordered for Salvador's body to be exhumed. In September of 2027, it was revealed that Salvador was not the father. I guess the fortune teller didn't see those results in her crystal ball. The embalmer said that Salvador's mustache was still in excellent condition. Salvador's life and work has influenced many other artists. Artists like Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst. He has had an influence on pop art, contemporary art, and other surrealists. He has been portrayed by Robert Pattinson in the movie Little Ashes, Adrian Brody in the movie Midnight in Paris, Ben Kingsley in the movie Dolly Land, Giles Lavouche, Edward Bear, Jonathan Cohen, Pio Marmai, and Did Air Flamon in the movie Dolly, Salvador Benavides in the short film The Death of Salvador Dolly, Richard David Kane in the TV show Horrible Histories, Ben Addis in the movie Hugo, Enrique Alcides in the TV show The Ministry of Time, David Shushe in the TV show Urban Myths, and Emo Phillips in the movie Weird, the Al Yankovic story. He is also mentioned in the play Hysteria, the books The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon, the QI book of the Dead by John Lloyd and John Mitchinson, and the graphic novel The Thread of Art by Gladimir Smutcha. The Spanish TV series Money Heist includes characters wearing a costume of red jumpsuits and Salvador Dali masks. The Salvador Dali Desert in Bolivia, the Dali Crater on the planet Mercury, and the container ship in the Dali are all named after Salvador Dali. And Salvador Dali is mentioned in the Taylor Swift song, The Last Great American Dynasty. It is track three off of her eighth studio album, Folklore. And that was the life of Salvador Dali. Thank you so much for listening to the sixth episode of the fifth season of History Show. Next week's episode is going to be about Clara Bow. I hope you come back for that. A few things before we go. If you want to follow this podcast on social media, the TikTok is at History Shelf. The Instagram is at History underscore Shelf underscore Pod. The Twitter is at History Shelf Pod. And the Facebook page is History Shelf Podcast. If you want to help out this podcast financially, there are a few ways you can do that. One is you can buy merch from the History Shelf merch store, or you can become a Patreon. This podcast is always going to be free, but there are some perks that come along with becoming a Patreon. The first tier is called History Student, and that is $1 a month. And with that, I will give you a shout out on all social media platforms that History Shelf is on. I will also choose one Patreon at random for each episode I do, and at the end of that episode, I will give that Patreon a shout out. The second tier is called History Fan, and that is $3 a month. And with that, you get the first tier. Plus, you get to vote in a poll that helps me choose the theme for the next season of this podcast. The third tier is called History Buff, and that is $20 a month. And with that, you get the first two tiers. Plus, you will get a handwritten note of thanks mail to you from me. And the last tier is called History Lover, and that is $40 a month. And with that, you get the first three tiers. Plus, you get to choose one item from the History Shelf merch store. You can choose any item that you want except for the zip-up hoodie. You can also take out ad space. 
on this podcast. I have a geek on Fiverr that lets you do that. Also, if you click on one of the affiliated links and you buy something, that also helps support the podcast. But if you don't want any of the merch or any of the perks and you don't want to buy anything, but you still want to help support the podcast, I have turned on listener support on Spotify for Podcasters. The links to everything that I just mentioned will be in the show notes. But as always, the best way that you can help support this podcast is just to continue to listen to it. And there are a few other ways that you can help out this podcast for free. One is if you are listening on a platform that lets you rate this podcast five stars and or leave a positive review. If you do that, that would be very helpful. Also, sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family would be very helpful. All right. Well, until next time, keep learning, keep loving history, and come back for next week's episode. Bye. Thank you.